There's not a mother, sister, friend, or brother that loves the way that Jesus can. He proved his love for me when he died on Calvary. He gave his life for fallen man. His love, his love is a boundless love. And it reaches down and touches me. His love, His love is an endless love that will last for all eternity. Jesus wants to love you. There is none above you. You are precious in His sight. Never fail you when the doubts assail you. He'll be with you day and night. His love, His love is a boundless love, and it reaches down and touches me. His love, His love is an endless love that will last for all eternity His love His love is a boundless love and it reaches down and touches me His love His love is an endless love that will last for all eternity His love is an endless Yesterday, I happened to catch a news report on the coronavirus. Anybody here heard of coronavirus? <laughs> no, nobody. Only 6% of the people who died in America, only 6% that died, died of coronavirus alone. Everything else, the other 94% died of some complication where coronavirus was mixed in, let's say, heart attacks, an accident, or running too fast. I don't know, whatever else they had. But only 6% died alone. And that's, that's the CDC, whoever those people are. That's the information they put out. So, we're, I guess we're 94% who didn't die. <laughs> oh, no. The 94% who did die were going to die anyway because of old age, maybe, or heart attacks, or sugar diabetes, or whatever else they had. But it seems like November 4th is going to be the magic day where everything will just lose, coronavirus will lose its, its importance to the globalists. If you know who the globalists are, desperately trying to bring in a one world government, it's not going to happen until Jesus says, now he's going to unroll that wrap, that, that seal and open the seal and then it'll start. Until then, Hitler, Napoleon, whoever, all those people who tried to bring in one world governments, they will fail. It's Jesus who brings in the seven years of terrible tribulation where he will judge the world uh, for what they did throughout the ages. And it's going to be horrific. So we need to understand these things. It's a fight for the soul of the human race. It's not necessarily, I, I talk to people who are totally caught up in the political agendas of the parties. Nothing to do with political. That's just a false front for people to fight over. It's a demonic attack on Christianity 
and on God's rule for this world. And they will be put down. I have read the end of the book. They will be destroyed. So relax, enjoy the show, stay away from the news if you can handle it, and let things happen as they may because God will make sure that they happen according to his will. Today I have an interesting message on repentance. What is true repentance? We, we hear of people, preachers, repentance means you need to stop doing this and that and this and that. But what does the Bible call true repentance that leads to salvation? Salvation for your soul. Because we need to understand this is what God came to do on this planet. From the foundation of the earth, the plane was put in place that he was going to take the sin of the world upon himself. By one offering, he perfected them that are sanctified. And by this one offering, he took away the sin of the world. The thing is, though, the catch is you have to cash in on it and accept it for yourself. Did Jesus die for your sin? Uh, or did he, or was it emptiness there for you? It's your choice. You have to make the choice to receive the forgiveness and the pardon that God is extending. <coughs> so this is it seems to be a problem in many churches. They have it all mixed up. You got to try your best, and then finally in the end, they say, God will decide if you did good enough. He'll put you in the scale, and that'll, the good will outweigh the bad. No, that's not how it's going to work. Here is how I'm going to be put on the scale. Jesus on one side and me on the other, and guess who's going to overpower the scale? It's going to be Jesus, so I'll be found not guilty. Hallelujah. Because me and Jesus are going to be scaled, and Jesus is the one that's going to be the one that's going to determine where I go. Hallelujah. Not me. I decided he was my savior. I decided he was going to pay for my sin. I, was, I decided he's going to take my sin upon himself. How did that decision come? By studying the word, realizing what Jesus did for me, and me accepting that. Me deciding. It's not an emotional thing like some people say. Some people have an emotional experience and they figure they're saved. No, that's not how it works. You need to make a conscious decision that Jesus is your Savior. If you do that, then you're on the right track. So before we get into this message today, let's rise and ask the Lord for a blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, mercy, kindness, and love. Lord, you will open our hearts today and we come against any evil spirit that tries to interfere with this message. We just, we just condemn that spirit in Jesus' name. He cannot do anything. So God, you will be able to come into people's hearts and minds and speak to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. For those watching on the internet, they need to pay attention because we have a lot of complete confusion out there. Christianity is not confusing. Once you know where you stand with God, then the confusion leaves. It's only before you know. Then people try all sorts of tricks and ideas and ways. And sometimes it gets pretty disgusting when you watch them practice their religion. In Acts 3, chapter 19, in, in chapter, Acts chapter 3, in verse 19, repent you therefore, be converted, 
and your sins, that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. How does one repent to be converted? Well, we're going to stop smoking and drinking and all of that stuff. This is what most people teach, and it's a good idea to quit all your bad stuff. But I got news for you. You're not going to be able to perfect yourself because it's out of your reach. So the Bible teaches if you have one little bad thought, that's enough to put you into the lake of fire. So you have to repent. Repent what? Repent how? If that's not, if me quitting my sinning is repenting, how come it doesn't get me into the kingdom of God? So what does the word repent truly mean when it comes to salvation? Yes, after I became a Christian, I repented of a lot of stuff. I could name you a few that are pretty interesting, but I'm not going to bore you with that. Repent means to get rid of all your ideas on how to get saved and take what the Word of God teaches. Many, many people in the Western civilizations have grown up in religious organizations and they've been told to do this and to do that on how to get saved. And most religions are way off the track but the ones that are closest to the truth are the most dangerous. So, repent. That means turn around. Get rid of your idea on how to get saved and go with what the Word of God says. What does the Word of God say? It says, get away from your ideas and turn to Jesus. For Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And when you turn to Jesus, you look at him, you see him, and then you accept him as your savior. That's when the conversion begins. What does it mean to be converted? It means to become something else something new. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are now seated in heavenly places. You're sealed onto the day of redemption. You become something that you were not before. And then your sins are washed away. Once you become God's child, your sin is then removed. The other day I was watching, reading something very interesting, which I never really paid attention to. I used to preach here, and I, 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 maybe it'll slip from my mouth again one day. God took care of our past, present, and future sins. The future sins is what I was studying. This guy had a long list on why our future sins cannot be forgiven. And I studied it and he made a lot of sense. They cannot actually be forgiven. And he had some lot of truth in that, but the answer to that one, it was blown, that whole thing was blown out of the waters with the first guy who answered underneath, you know, give you some ideas. He said, there's no such a thing as a future sin. You're in the now. Tomorrow, you're going to be in the now. There is never a future sin that you commit. You only commit a sin that you commit today. You can't commit a sin tomorrow, today. Do you understand that one? So the future sins are gone. They're not even there. They never were there. It's only a now sin that you commit. So it tells us, we will turn to Jesus, we will be converted, and then your sins will be washed away. That's past and present, hallelujah. And I am happy and I can accept that because whatever I will do in the future, I know my God will take care of that too. Listen to how 
it works. In Matthew chapter 13, chapter 13, verse 24. I want you to study, uh, study with me a little bit about the parable of the, of the tares and the wheat. A, a farmer will tell you that a tear and a wheat, as they grow, look very much the same from a distance. You have to have close inspection to see the difference. The real difference comes when it comes to a harvest. That's when you see the fruit and the difference in the fruit. It tells, it says another parable that, he, parable that he put forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in this field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, dost, did thou not sow good seed in thy field, from whence had it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done it. The servant said unto him, Will thou that we go and gather up the tares? And he said, No, least while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barden. So here, when we today when we talk to people, everybody's a Christian, regardless who they are. You see Nancy Pelosi quoting scriptures, and you hear of how, what an incredible uh, relationship, or, or what an incredible faith she has. How can somebody call himself a Christian who believes in murdering unborn babies? Impossible. Any of those things that people say they do or do or agree with, if it's uh, abortion, agreeing with abortion, agreeing with, with homosexuality, agreeing with any of those things that the Bible so strongly teaches against, and you say you're a Christian, I will question who is in your heart and who is speaking to you. Because many people can walk the walk. But are they really born again by the Spirit of God? They have the grace to walk. It seems like they have a, a very, uh, a, a way of walking that you would never notice. And look at the difference between King Saul and King David. I want you to listen to this now. King Saul and King David, the way you saw them from the outside, they were pretty much the same. King Saul killed people, he killed a whole bunch of priests, and he did a lot of other stuff. King David, basically the same thing. He killed his own best friend, his wife's husband, and then, she, and then he killed him in, in battle so that he could marry his, his, his best friend's wife or one of his friend's wife. Can you imagine that? I like that guy's woman. I'm going to kill him and marry her. That's what King David did. What's the difference between King David and King Saul? When King Saul was found out, when he was, uh, he, when it was, when he was put to the test, Samuel said to him, you disobeyed God. What did King Saul say? He said, at least come and honor me before the people. Never mind what God thinks of me. Come and honor me before the people. You see his heart? He doesn't care about God. And now you look at King David when it was told him what he was doing. He fell on his face before God and wept for a whole week and cried out to God for forgiveness and that maybe the child would live that was, uh, that was born out of wedlock. 
you see the difference in the two people, even though their walks were basically the same. The tear and the wheat were walking together. But when come the harvest, the difference was very clearly seen. And I want to inject here, there are many, many, many people who are in churches, who claim to know they know the Lord God, but in reality they don't. And they need to make sure that they do. Jesus loves all people. He is willing that none perish. And if you are going to be nonchalant about the whole thing, then it's your fault. If you're going to depend on your religion to get you into the kingdom of heaven, you got the Bible, you can see the answer. It is your fault. So are you a wheat or are you a tear? If you're a tear today, you need to, and, and it starts to bother you that maybe you're not right with God, then it's time to do something about it. And what is that you do? You simply turn to Jesus and ask for mercy. That's called repentance. Is don't I have to get baptized? Don't I have to go to church? Don't I have to go to prayer meeting? Don't I have to do this or that? No, you don't do nothing. You turn to Jesus. And then Jesus takes care of the rest. Because once you become his child, once his spirit is within you, mark my words, there's going to be a change in you. If it happened to me, it surely can happen to me. I remember at about the age of 26 or 27, I was the life of the party, and it was I thought I was. Instead of trying to, uh, instead of uh, wanting to uh, listen to a preacher on the radio, I would turn that station as quickly as I possibly could. I love country music. That was the big thing in those days. And whatever garbage was on TV, I would watch with a passion. But once Jesus was there, then suddenly those things started to lose their glamour. They started to lose their luster. Instead of planning on how to sin against God, I was trying on, I was planning on how to avoid those things. That's what happens to somebody who truly has a change of heart, who truly has repented. Was I a good goody two shoes after I became a Christian? I wish I were, but I have to sadly tell you, many a times I had to cry out to God to forgive me for the idiot that I had been. So God wants us to know he will do the work and he, by scripture that teaches us, will perform it. In Luke chapter 22 in verse 31, listen to this one. There's Simon Peter talking to Jesus just before the crucifixion. And we all know Simon Peter, those of us who read the Bible, he was kind of a braggart. He liked to tell Jesus how good he was and how brave he was. Remember when he cut off that guy's ear? He didn't aim for the ear, he aimed for the guy's head. By the grace of God, he missed that. Or maybe Jesus would have put it, would have put it back on. That would have been fun to watch, eh? Putting back a guy's head. And, but it was his ear. And then Peter dropped his sword and ran for his life. Oh, what, a, what an incredible brave person he was. And here, listen to this. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. It's, it's, what, this is where the, the, the power of Christianity is. Jesus saying, I have prayed for you. Who is at the right hand of the Father right now, praying for us, interceding for us? It's Jesus. This is exactly here. Listen, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. So, 
when Jesus prays for us, and he is, we can be assured that our faith is going to stay. I don't care what comes in the future. Our, our future is in the, hands, in, in the hands of Jesus' prayer. Will he ever stop interceding? Not on your life. You can forget about it. So you can rest assured. If you're safe today, you're going to be saved for the rest of eternity because Jesus will always be there to keep us. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Instead of coming against the brethren, we should strengthen the brethren. Why do the brethren need to be strengthened all the time? And it was only after he was converted, that was after the crucifixion, when he was converted. Before that, everybody was, was maybe, they were there, but not quite finished yet. The, the salvation wasn't finished yet. But after Jesus rose from the dead, the conversion was finished. The work was finished. And he said, after that, you strengthen the brethren. When you look at Judas Iscariot, he did basically the same thing as Peter did. Judas Iscariot uh, denied the Lord. No, Judas Iscariot sold the Lord. And Simon Peter denied the Lord. Basically the same thing. What's the difference between the two? Jesus prayed for Simon Peter. That's the anchor. That's our hope. Jesus praying for us. And then when he was converted, he was commanded to strengthen the brethren. Why are we commanded to strengthen the brethren? Because when you leave this place, you're going to be bombarded by the world. You're going to be bombarded by Satan. And you need all the encouragement you can get. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus will take care of you. Don't worry when you fall. He's going to bring you back. Because you belong to him. You have sold yourself to him. You are now his purchased possession. So once you're converted, God Jesus prays for you, and it's now our job to pray for one another. Look at Philippians chapter 1 in verse 6. P, the Apostle Paul makes it this, puts it this way. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So where does that leave us? Secure safe, pure, and holy, waiting for the coming back of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am encouraged when I study scripture. Almost on every page there is an encouragement for me that Jesus loves me, never leaves me or forsakes me, and will always keep me as the apple of his eye because I turn to him for that salvation, which God the Father determined at the foundation of this world. Before the foundation of this world, he determined that's how I'm going to be saved from the wrath of Satan and hell. So God made sure. Listen to this here. In 1 John chapter 5 in verse 10. I love this one. He that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believes not God has made him a liar because he believes not the record that God give of his Son. And what is the record? That God has given to us eternal life and that life is in his Son. If you don't believe it, you make God a liar. Do we believe it? Oh, yes, I do. That is for sure. And that record is there. It's the record that God wants us to know. It's, it's the only way of salvation. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. 
There is no such a thing as Mennonite, Hutterite, Catholic, or Episcopalian, or Muslim, or whatever else you want to call it. If you have God, Jesus, you have life. If you don't have him, you have not life. Either you're saved or you're lost. It's your choice. There is nothing to do with the religion you're in. And this is the record that God has given to us. Eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that has the son has life. He that has not the son of God has not life. And I remember old dear Perry F. Rockwood. He would bring this across day after day. These things have I written unto you that you may know not hope, not wish, nor maybe, not but, that you may know that you have eternal life. Do we know that we have eternal life? I do. When, do, when does my eternal life begin? The moment of my conception into the kingdom of God. When does my earthly life begin? The moment I'm conceived in my mother's womb. And by the way, you have to be born of water. That means you have to be born a natural birth before you can become be born a spiritual birth. So when I was born naturally, I became a citizen of this earth. And I was born to my family. When I was born again, when I accepted Jesus, I was born spiritually into the kingdom of God. And how long will that birth last? For the rest of eternity. I'm going to be a citizen of heaven and God will be my father. I cannot ever, ever say God is not my father because he became my father when I turned to Jesus for my salvation. These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know? Or do you have a doubt in your mind? The reason you have a doubt is this. You don't quite trust Jesus. You don't quite trust the word of God. Maybe if, or you don't, tr you, you, or you may think, I may not be good enough. I may somehow fail. I may somehow fall once further down the line. Never mind the down the line. We're here. It's today. What you to do today is what counts. So will I fall off today? No, never ever. Because I'm kept by the precious prayers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He intercedes for me for the rest of eternity. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. Hallelujah. I know, I'm sure, I'm convinced. I, am, uh, I don't believe in Christianity, uh, Christianity. I have become Christianity, hallelujah, if that makes sense in one way or another. It isn't something I believe in, it's something I've become part of. It's not something I believe in anymore, or I don't know if I'm wording it right. It's something that I've entered into and become part of. It's like hot water and cold water being mixed together, you cannot separate them anymore, hallelujah. That's what me and Jesus have accomplished through his blood. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19, what if somebody accepts Jesus and down the road he walks away from God? And, and, and as of late, when you go on YouTube, you find those people. They grew up in churches. They actually grew up in pastors' homes. They've been Christians all their life. Anyways, they say they have. And then finally... They get a revelation somehow that there's other ways into the kingdom. And what happens to them? Why does it happen to them? It's called a tear. They look like a wheat up till now, but now it comes out, it's a tear. That's why they walk away. And if they stay like that till they die, 
they are a tear. Listen to this, 1 John chapter 2 in verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, if they had been a wheat, they would no doubt have continued to be a wheat, not a tear. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. That's simply how it works. They never truly were born again by the Spirit of God. That's the only way the Bible can explain this. If somebody walks away from God who we thought he was worshiping, who he maybe thought he was worshiping, and now all of a sudden, and I couldn't believe it not too long ago, this guy from Christianity to atheism. And I listened to him, and he had all, he, he accepted Jesus as his Savior. He, he did all the right things. He grew up in church. He, he worshiped God. Now all of a sudden, there is no God. And he was totally convinced there is no God. If he's going to stay like that all the way to the end, they went out from us because they were not of us. Had they been of us, they surely would have continued with us. But they went out so that we can know that they weren't part of us. This is what the Bible teaches. So the question is, are we in the kingdom of God? How do we know? Is it some emotional experience that we have? No, not necessarily. There, yes, there can be an emotional experience. But the true way of, of turning to this Jesus is a conscious decision. I'm going to receive him as my savior. I'm going to call him into my heart. And I ask him that he will save me from the wrath that is to come. And all the, the Bible teaches us that's all you have to do. The rest is up to God and he will save you for the Lord is willing that none perish. So open your heart to this and become a blessing to yourself. Amen. Hallelujah. I have the world to offer you. Yes, you have the world to hold till the day when God declares time on earth shall be no more. Fire and brimstone shall rain down and melt it like the snow. What will you have to offer then to a dying soul? Think of all you're giving up. I'm giving up the chance to die, spend eternity in hell, burning in a lake of fire. I thank God he's made a way that I might escape. By the living grace of God, I shall see his face. You don't sin, you're good enough. There's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What about the friends you lose? There may be some that don't agree. They may say that I'm a fool, but they don't have to stand for me. Jesus said he'd be my friend, and he'd walk with me. And he'd never leave my side throughout eternity. But life will be too dull for you. Everything you've offered me don't mean nothing to my heart, for from sin I've been set free. Praise the Lord, I'm going home, never to rejoice. Take this world and get behind, I have found peace of mind, everlasting joy is mine, Jesus is my choice.